church in a faith community that saw who I was as a queer and trans person as shameful and disgusting and something that barred me forever from spiritual authority or faithful leadership. I left that church when I was about 15, but the message had sunken in too deeply um, to be excised by my exit. Since then, a big part of my personal work has been healing from the overwhelming shame of just being who I am and understanding that I'm just as deserving as anyone else to have a voice and to contribute my gifts. It's been a long journey to really get that, that I matter, that my experience matters, my voice matters, and my work matters. It's also been a long journey uh, to find a place of belonging in Christianity for me as a trans person, but I'm so thankful that I found that in the Evangelical Lutheran Church, uh, which I'm a rostered leader right now. So um, there are some struggles that aren't necessarily unique to trans experience, but that are common to our experience. For a long time, people viewed the sin of pride as superbia. Superbia means thinking more of yourself, thinking too much of yourself, that you're higher than others or even higher than God. Toxic masculinity and white supremacy, for instance, have roots in superbia. But feminists such as Kathleen Norris drew attention to the sin of acedia. Acedia can be translated as slothfulness but feminists have seen it as the inverse of superbia. If with superbia, one makes too much of themselves, with acedia, one makes too little of themselves. Feminists saw that historically, women might be more subject to the sin of acedia rather than superbia. And I think that's true for many minorities. Repentance from acedia would look like taking up more space, owning one's voice and speaking one's truth as one who has a right among many to do the same. It also looks like celebrating one's gifts and strengths and sharing them. I was guilty of the sin of acedia. And I really want people to know that if you're watching and if you're trans or queer or non-binary, demand that you are treated with dignity and respect. Don't settle for anything less. Every human being deserves that, no matter how different from the norm we may be. And part of your work as someone who falls outside the norm is to believe in your beauty and your worth. And if you're in a place that doesn't do that with you, find one that will. So even though I now stand in the knowledge that I belong and that I have something to offer, still as a trans person, I will always be on the margins. You can count the number of transgender people who have been ordained in mainline denominations on one or two hands, sadly. My experience will always be a little on the outside, but it's that vantage point that gives me the grace and the perspective to find others on the margins and invite them in. I think we always have to be aware with groups who have experienced marginalization or societal and spiritual trauma and abuse that master narratives about who is in and who is out, who is acceptable and who is worthy, worked hard to program them to downplay their beauty and their worth. So when you're working with people on the margins, one of your first goals is to recognize that beauty and that worth. And it's astonishingly simple to do if your eyes are open. My theology is, grounded on the conviction that Jesus is always found on the outside and at the bottom of things. In ministry, I work to draw into leadership and to uplift the gifts and the strengths of the most marginalized members of our community, whether it be the elderly, the homeless, trans women of color, immigrants, and refugees, all populations I've worked with and that are very close to my heart. As a faith leader, I'm called to preach and to proclaim the good news made real in Jesus and to insist that we are right to hope in the future of God's promise for the world, for the love and freedom of all peoples. 
I'm about lifting up the voices that don't get heard and about putting their needs and concerns, their hopes and their struggles, but most importantly, their gifts at the center. So I just wanted to throw something out for reflection um, for people. Um, when is the time that someone noticed a gift in you? And can you recall how it impacted you? Did it change the course of your life? And I'm expecting that it's not gonna be too hard for you to remember exactly the moment and exactly who it was that called it out in you. And I'm sure that it probably did change the course of things for you and open something. So it's important to remember when working with everyone else. So in addition to making it a priority to find and to celebrate and develop gifts and strengths of outsiders and rejected peoples, as a trans person, just by de facto, I lead by example. I view my gender transition as the holy endeavor and one that has something to teach others about who we are meant to be in God. It was Oscar Wilde who said, he who would lead a Christ-like life is he who is perfectly and absolutely himself. I think that one of the greatest callings on our lives is to be as particularly ourselves as possible. That is to become who God created us to be without the defenses and without the fear to fully experience the love and the freedom that await us in Jesus Christ. I began my gender transition 18 years ago because being assigned female at birth wasn't the end of my story. It was just the beginning. Then as now, my delight is in the Lord so that with the psalmist I can proclaim, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It is through a, a hard earned integration of this understanding of my own belovedness that I'm able to claim it so forcefully for others for whom the world deems unworthy and invaluable. So now I wanna share with you a story from the parish at which I most recently served, St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Harlem. And I chose this story because I think St. Mary's has a beautiful way of being in relationship with the neighborhood and of connecting with people that focuses not just on meeting needs, although they do a lot of that, but on seeing and valuing the gifts that people bring and in that way, including them in the work of justice. At St. Mary's, community members who otherwise wouldn't have found a place to thrive are brought, are brought into leadership. One of those people was Jenny, and I, I have her permission to share her story with you. Jenny is a transgender woman and refugee. When we met, Jenny was living in the refugee shelter hosted by the church, and she seemed aimless and depressed and without purpose in her new situation. I got to know her, and she opened up little by little. I shared some of my story with her as well. Jenny had come to apply to the U.S. To, Jenny had come to the U.S. to apply for asylum because of the discrimination and the violence that she faced in Honduras for being transgender. It was so bad there that she had to flee for her life and leave her entire family, which is a story that is unfortunately not uncommon. When Jenny got to this country, where she thought she'd be safe, she was the victim of a violent hate crime in Jersey City. She was thrown from a second floor window. Jenny's life was hanging on by a thread and she survived the surgeries and spent four long months in the hospital where she had no one to visit her. But Jenny says that God gave her a second life. After spending time in detention in New Jersey, she was connected to the refugee shelter at St. Mary's. And when she first arrived in what was a totally foreign place, she kept to herself and she wouldn't often look up. But I watched that congregation hold onto hope for Jenny when the obstacles in her life seemed so big because they knew that the only way to hold onto hope is to do it together. So I think that a good leader, in addition to creating other leaders, also invites people into a story. In church, that story is that life in Jesus Christ 
transforms us and emboldens us to live lives of service and of love. That Christ loves us into love and frees us into freedom. And neighborhoods also have stories and their own language for expressing their hopes and what they've struggled through to get to today. When it was time for food programs at St. Mary's to write a mission statement, I collected interviews with all the volunteers and coordinators, and I tried to discern the thread of the story I was hearing. I did not have to try hard. Time and again, the story that I heard was, quote, St. Mary's was there for me. I wanna be there for the next person. I wanna give back. Connecting that to the larger story of God's love for us and Jesus' commandment to love and serve one another is just a no-brainer. When a longtime volunteer invited Jenny to start volunteering at the food pantry, I noticed her start to come to life. Shortly thereafter, I offered to train her as an accolade. And since that first Sunday, when serving as a crucifer and chalice bearer, Jenny has never missed an opportunity to serve on the altar. Jenny began volunteering in the church thrift shop too. And after volunteering faithfully for months, she also stepped into a role of more responsibility. As I watched her build relationships with clients and saw her talent for creating beautiful spaces and putting together stunning outfits, I knew it was time for her to step into greater leadership. We asked Jenny to become the thrift store manager and we saw a nearly tenfold increase in the profits the church was making, money that went back into, this, into sustaining the ministries. Jenny transformed the thrift shop from a place where money had been mishandled to a responsible place with integrity where every client coming in was known by name. We trusted Jenny and gave her an endeavor to be responsible for her, and she thrived. We didn't relate to this new member of our community as simply a recipient of shelter or of food. We saw her gifts and invited her into ministering to the community. Jenny found her place in the story of St. Mary's Church to love and accompany and serve the neediest and most vulnerable among us. As the thrift shop manager, Jenny now always makes sure that the church office has a few coats and pants on hand for people coming in from the community who have neither. When you see her volunteering at Pantry, all you have to do is step back and watch how she blesses every single client with a beautiful smile that beams with pride and with tenderness for the plight of others. She greets the neediest members of the community with care and kindness and warmth. Jenny still lives in the shelter, but she's now receiving benefits and trans-affirming life care for the first time in her life and she's saving money. Jenny's building a life that's connected and meaningful and has at the center of it, a community of faith that did not let her go. A year and a half ago, Jenny wasn't able to connect to her dreams, but today she dreams of having a place of her own close by where she says she can always come back to St. Mary's. So I just wanna leave you with, it is all about placing the gifts and the strengths and the potential of people into the center, especially the ones that you might not think would have them. It's only then that we understand that they are gifts to us. So I just want to leave you with um, a little outline. And is David with us? I believe he is, but I think he's in the attendees. David, um, I'm trying to send him a text. I'm sorry, guys. Um, David, if you would follow the link, uh, the other link, I think that you were sent this morning, uh, you will be part of the panelists. And if you all have any questions, uh, please, uh, you can type them up or you can, I think there's a little thing to raise your hand as well. Uh, while we try to make sure David is in the correct place. But thank you all so much for being with us. Uh, we really appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for your patience. Um, yes, thank you so much for your patience. It's difficult to be in three different places uh, <laughs> when we're doing this. <laughs> 
Um, so we'll wait. Um, I have a question, uh, Atticus. Mm -hmm. When did you when did you feel a call uh, to be in ministry or to even be in lay ministry? When, how did that come about in your own life? Oh my gosh, uh, Sandra, ever since I was, I, I think it really is one of my earliest memories was that sense of closeness to God, but also in protection from God, but also a sense of um, deep accountability. And, um, but in my faith tradition growing up, the charismatic evangelical church that I was raised in, you know, people like me, you know, weren't, uh, you know, we're damned to hell basically. And also in addition to that, you know, would never be in leadership. So it took me that, that call went, went silent for a while for me um, until I learned about progressive Christianity, which was many years later. Um, I was like 27 when I heard about Union Theological Seminary and from there just opened up my world. Awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. Debbie, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad that you were able to join us. Um, and um, I shared a little bit about uh, your story, you know, uh, the description that we had for our um, webinar. So thank you for being here. And please, if you're ready, you can con uh, continue now. So thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you so much for having me, Sandra. And thank you, Atticus. Um, yeah, I was not the attendees. I was like, I pretty sure I should be able to speak here, but I'm not able to. So hello, everyone. My name is David. My pronouns are he and they. Uh, before I want to start, I just, again, I want to thank everybody for this opportunity. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my journey as a trans young person of color and also share my reflections about ministry with young trans people, queer people. Um, as a trans and queer Latinx immigrant, I confront a lot of interpersonal uh, violence on many, many levels on a daily basis. I also um, educated, documented, light-skinned, a masculine presented person. So I actually also experienced violence in a very different way and I experienced privilege in a different way. So both from having the experience of the pain that it comes from being rejected and abandoned and the violence that I get um, as a minority person, I also have a lot of privileges that allow me to see the other side. And so I think because of that combination and my awareness about all of it, uh, I'm feeling blessed in many ways for what I do have. I center a lot of my ministry around how to end dehumanizing political, cultural, and economic structures um, that oppress us. So um, I wanna, like I said, I'm speaking um, as somebody who is, I'll be speaking as a person who is tr trans, but a, a trans and young person of color and been in a lot of spaces in that, in that way. I'm also speaking as somebody who, since I was in seventh grade, have been, you know, teaching first and first graders, second graders, third graders, kindergartners as a teacher assistant, running an after school program where I'm helping to run the after school help. Since I was in seventh grade, all through high school, all through college, I've mentored people who are younger than me, always been um, that kind of person who is involved with youth ministry before I knew to call it youth ministry. Um, and I'm also speaking as somebody who is in church, has been in church most of my life, and um, I'm seeking, I'm discerning my call to the priesthood right now in the Episcopal Church. So I'll just share a little bit of my experience, and then uh, if there's questions, we'll, we'll take it from there. So um, a lot of my life as a trans person, and Attic has mentioned this a little bit, is I struggle with being the one paving the road for myself. I've been the one, I can't look up to anybody um, and see myself reflected. Not until, you know, recently with Atticus, one person that I can mention of all the people. Um, so for a long time, I felt this as a very incredibly frustrating and painful loneliness. I, and as I've recently discerned my call to the priesthood, that has, become, has come into a different understanding. One in which I experienced a true connection to God in which my Christian faith is what helps me understand this not as a lonely experience but as what god is calling me to do i mentioned this because i think that my faith exploration um my my exploration of myself as a trans person and my and my journey as an immigrant i think are all linked um as i've allowed myself to explore my gender identity i feel like my connection to god has improved 
as I think, as I've understood God and understood my, God's call for me, my connection to God has strengthened. I have understood my identity better as a trans person. I have understood my role as an immigrant, like my journey as an immigrant and why my place is in the United States. And I've, I've seen how God, what God is calling me to do in a lot of times is to interrupt, to question things that so many people take for granted. Um, because gender is such a foundational um, thing in society that once I broke free of that, it was like, if I can break with the gender norms, then a lot of society comes into question. A lot of how we do things, a lot of how we run things, a lot of how we relate to other people. Um, and so it's not, so for me, it really, I really believe that trans people and I, are trans people. And I, and I say this from talking and being around so many trans people and looking up to all the work that trans people are doing. I really see them as prophets in our society. We're challenging society despite the cost to our lives. And we do this um, to live into a promise that God has given us of being free, of allowing the Holy Spirit to manifest itself through us. Um, so I think being trans for me eventually has become the closest, the thing that has brought me closest to God. But at first, that wasn't my experience. At first, when I first realized that I was trans, it was like a devastating blow to who I was, to my dreams, who I was going to become. Because the world is not safe. Society is not safe for us. Um, and our Christian church has been largely a perpetrator of instilling a culture of hostility and aggression to people who are different, who are queer, who are who are trans, who will, um, and so I think it's, it's our, now our responsibility as Christians, and from my perspective, since I'm in the Episcopalian Church, it's our responsibility to challenge that, to not just say that we're accepting. Of course, the Episcopal Church has a vision of, has a vision and mission for itself to be accepting, and to, but now it's time. We, need, we are really far from that, to really being that people. And I think we really need to speak out for the people who, who are suffering right now and to speak out, especially when the language of Christianity is used to perpetuate violence. And I say that before I go into what I think that we can do to invite young trans people into the church. But first I wanted to say why, right? Share my experience. And the why is very simple. As we've prayed and worshiped and proclaimed the gospel and promoted justice and peace and love this past week, a trans Afro-Latina 27 year old woman Leilene Polanco died in Rikers, okay? And last week, just a week before that, a 25-year-old Joanna Medina died in Texas at a detention, after being in a detention center for only seven weeks. That was only after a year of the death of Roxana Hernandez, a 33-year-old uh, immigrant from, trans woman immigrant, uh, who died in ICE, under ICE custody because of uh, medical neglect and presumably from the findings from a beating. So there's a, a statistic that by Consumer Health Foundation that trans women of color have a life expectancy of 35 years of age. 35 as opposed to the 78 of cis women, right? So I don't want to go more into the why, because why we should care because, or the depressing parts of things, because I do hope that there are trans people of color who are listening to this uh, webinar or who will look at this webinar and they, and it's, it's devastating to always feel, hear the bad things. So I'm kind of kind of talk about how we can invite people into the church, the young people into the church. So um, I'll say, from my, again, I'll speak from my perspective. From my own journey, I feel like when I'm always going into church, I'm always the one person, not just church, but everywhere, I'm the one challenging norms, right? I'm challenging uh, many ways in which um, people take things for granted, right? And my faith, because my faith has been strong, walking into churches that have not been accepting has not shaken my faith, has not shaken my connection to God. It's shaken my connections to the institutions who are proclaiming these things. That's a different story for a lot of trans people and a lot of queer people, especially of color, who grew up being told that they're not loved by God, that they're, they're condemned, right? Um, when I... One second. So again, I feel like God is calling me specifically to go into spaces to question, interrupt, and reorient myself to tradition and to teach others how to reorient themselves to tradition, but also towards faith and towards themselves and towards calling. Um, 
when I talk to a lot of trans people of color and young people of color throughout my various work, when I mention church, they always say the same thing. Church is oppressive. Hold on one second. Someone with a barrel has come by. Okay. They always say church is oppressive for even the LGBT friendly churches. Even the, old, the older LGBT pastors and priests themselves are oppressive because often we're trying to mimic institutions. Our churches, they tell me, are not life-giving spaces. They're just another system of control, a place where you have to try to fit in yourself into some kind of normalized behavior, whether it's clothing, language, music style, worship style. And most, pe most queer people, young people, are just not even interested in what is normal and what is not normal. It's not of a rebellion that perhaps people, generations before us have had of like we're gonna rebel to be seen. I think it's I think it's we're beyond that. We're just boxes, it's irrelevant to us. Those things are irrelevant. We don't care enough to try to rebel against them. They're just not part of our reality as young people. We haven't had to grow up in that. So even right myself, right, as a trans person, I'm 20 years old, I talk to 15 year old kids, young trans people, and I am blown away by what their questions are, what their agendas are their identities because they are growing up in a whole different thing that I am challenged by 28 years old and I'm challenged by what they're telling me and I have to listen to what they're saying because I don't know I can't possibly know what you're right so it's interesting that the church the topics that the church struggles with young people just take as a given because we're growing up in our schools and our colleges and our community centers and our extracurricular extracurricular activities being told that, you know, being taught in different learning styles, being taught about nonviolent communication, reparation, uh, restorative justice, critical thinking about embracing our identities to stand up what's unjust. But then we go into the church and we're expected to sit, listen to other people tell us what to do, listen to the same language that has always been told, has always been used oppressively, but we're supposed to kind of like use our imagination to imagine that something different, right? And we're supposed to listen to the same type of music, smell the same kind of incense, all the sensory kind of things that to me, I think, have triggered like a psychological allergy in young people for church. I, do, I was just at a, I was just at a, I just helped put on a very beautiful service the other day. And I saw young people of all kinds of shapes, sizes, colors of hairs, piercings come into the church and they looked terrified when they realized what they were walking into. Like, oh, we didn't realize it was church. We thought it was like an art exhibit. And it was an art exhibit and it was celebrating queer stuff, but they, it was allergic. They were having an allergic reaction to all the sensory things that they've grown up uh, associating with people telling them not to be themselves, right? So all of that to say, we need to listen to young people. We need to take a lead from them. They're the ones that can tell us how to minister to them. They know young, young queer people of color care about morality. They care about justice and they care about respect. That's why language matters so much in trans and queer communities right now. That's why pronouns matter so much. That's why queer identity so much, so much. You can, I, I challenge you all who are watching this to Google, to research gender identities. There, you will find more than 10 different gender identities, pronouns. There are so many ways in which people are being creative. Language matters to people. Justice matters to people. Respect matters to people, right? To young people, right? It's not that they don't care about morality. It's that they see it differently. So we as, and now I'm switching to my role as a more older person because now I'm old according to young people, right? Um, we need to take a step back as a church, and I'll include myself in the church. We need to be so much more humble. We need to go through a discernment process of what it means to really be a church that will be here for young people, that young people will want to come in. Because young people, young queer trans people, if you go into the spaces, they're looking for spiritual connection that sustains their growth, their freedom, and their activism. And they're finding those tools. They're finding those tools in community centers. They're finding those tools in protests. They're finding those tools everywhere else but the Christian church. And it's sad because my Christian faith has strengthened me, grounds me in a way that nothing else has grounded me. But I 
I didn't have the same terrible experience that many people did, right? So as I said, I think we really need to hum listen humbly, learn and follow young people, young trans people of color's lead. We need to, one of my mentors here in New York Diocese, um, Reverend Gladys Diaz was talking to me the other day about the difference between coaching versus mentoring. When you're coaching somebody, you're asking them about their aspirations, their goals, what do they want, right? How do they, where do they find their energy, right? Not mentorship where you're trying to model them into your shape, what you think should be because that's what has been. You're not trying to mimic an old system. You're asking them what they want to be. So just in conclusion, I think it's really important that we let young people fail. We need to let them work out what they need to work out and be there for them every single time, whether they succeed or they fail, affirm them, build them up, tell them that they're fantastic, that they tried, that these are their things that they learned, right? And as a trans person, I think it has been, a, for me, it has been about my transition. I had a lot of things ready at hand because I went to a school that gave me the insurance that I needed. I had, even though I could do all my transition all at once, it was traumatizing to go just have the answers right away. I needed to go through an entire transition period, a discernment process, we call it, right, in the Christian church, a discernment process to who I am as a trans person, as a trans person of faith, to be able to have a relationship with God that really allows me to understand, to feel free, right, and to be myself. And I've done all of that with the help of God and, and my, under, my re- um, my, under, my own understanding of who God is and what trans identity is. We need to allow all of that room for trans, for trans young people. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and Atticus, for those uh, words. Um, I believe that y'all have some questions. Um, and again, if, for you that are participating, please, if you have a question, please type it up or raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, so I'll leave yeah, it to I you can, guys. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question of Atticus that, um, cause I think it's important. Atticus, I know you talk a lot about bringing people from the margins in, inviting them in. Can you talk more specifically about what churches or faith communities can do? Absolutely. Um, thanks, David. Um, the one, th the number one thing on my mind right now is pronouns, just the practice of sharing pronouns when you go to a meeting, when you meet someone for the first time, you know, and go ahead and be the one to, to take the initiative. And it's so easy to just say, can we share pronouns? And, you know, it goes from there. If people need an explanation, go for it. And that's a, a you know, a, a learning opportunity. Um, I find that it also communicates that it's not only trans and non-binary um, people who have identities. We all do. Like that's including cis straight people who use pronouns that are more commonly um, in relationship to each other. Um, and so it's just that sense of saying, hey, we're all showing up as you know, the human beings that we feel we're called to be. Um, it's not just these you know, outsiders and different people who we need to accommodate. Um, this is something for everyone. And of course, gender inclusive language is, is a big one. Um, and it's just that, you know, just having that awareness and creating that space that, you know, the image of God looks like a, as many different humans as there are. And so let's, um, let's expand our vision of God, our vision of what um, faithfulness looks like, of what um, leaders can look like. And, you know, it's funny how just slight, these slight um, changes and these slight, um, um, I'm not sure the word I'm thinking of, but just these, these slight um, changes can, the, it's the, the, the huge practices. shift. That the, practices, thank you so much. Um, yeah, practices, because it's something that you want to do, you know, just as a practice all the time. Um, so yeah, I think those are the two big things that are on my mind. And especially, I think it hits a personal note for me, um, because I'm in a new city now where people haven't known me for 15 years like they did when I lived in New York. And everyone, I found that people assume that I'm a cis, straight, or gay, white guy. There's a lot of assumptions that go into that. So yeah, what, another thing I was going to say is don't, don't make assumptions, don't assume. But when people, you know, when someone else says, hey, can we share pronouns or my pronouns are, 
it also gives me the opportunity to show up as um, in my fullness um, and in all the facets of my of my identity. Um, yeah, I think yeah. I would just I like to yeah. add to that, and I think that's perfect because what I was going to add is that it lets young people know that they are being heard. We heard you. We know that mm. these things mm. matter to you, mm. and we're going to do. We're going to change. We find it challenging, but we're going to do it because we care about you and what you have to say and that you are going to be able to hear us better if we use the language that you are using. And it also will invite young people in to start to learn their lang the language of older right. people. Right, and, and let's figure out what it means together. Right, because I'm 28 years old. This stuff that's coming up with the young people, I'm like, hey. um, okay, yeah. I need to continue to be upkeep my Instagram because otherwise I'm going to lose track, you know, of what, I, I what love, is the community I center. love, Debbie, I love your emphasis on listening um, and that being a huge way into um, a new way to be in relationship. And instead of thinking that we have all the answers or the church has all the answers, it should be something that's always growing right. and always changing. So, um, David, I have a question for you. Um, what would you say to young queer and trans people specifically who are trying to navigate spaces of faith and religion? I have a lot to say, but I'll keep it short. I think mm -hmm. one of the first, thing, the first things is go on your faith journey, go on your own faith journey, explore what it means to you. Don't let anybody, um, not your priests, not your parents, not your not even your queer and trans community don't let them tell you what you should believe what you should think or should not think what speaks to you right how does god speak to you where do you find divinity right tell your story and then tell your story tell your story write draw sing dance act express yourself express yourself through all through all of this journey express yourself because there is a there's a richness in your experience there is you know there is a richness in tradition there's a richness in Christian tradition even, uh, but whatever tradition you come from, there is a richness in that because there's a history and there's, it tells you where you come from and how do you can ground yourself. But you, don't need to, you need to find a way that, where you can own your tradition. What does it mean to have your faith, to be in your faith? What does your tr faith tradition mean to you? What does it say like for you? What does it look like for you? How does it feel? What feels like home when you're in a faith community? What are those aspects? What do you need? for healing, for growth, for, for feeling connected to God. And how does scripture talk to you? Whatever scripture, it could be poems, right? It could be poems. Like I like to read poems and I like to read scripture next side to side. So it's a lot about exploration and expression of who we are and what's our journey because we are divine beings. We, God is in all of us and God is acting through all of us. So there's no reason to shy away from it. Um, and there's places that will honor you and if there's not we can build them i like that debbie thinking of tradition and not just as something that should be mimicked and just force fed to us like we're drinking water from from a fire hydrant and stuffing it down but you know actually taking up our spot in it um, which is unique to every individual and adding to it um adding to the layers upon layers of you know, prayers of self-expression of, you know, relationship, um, to God, to the world and how we understand that in a given time. Um, so I love that. Thank you. Thank you. All. Well, I have a question for Sandra because Sandra, I feel like, yeah, surprise Sandra. Um, unless there's, you know, a burning question from somewhere in, you know, in the, in the world of the web, I do, I do want to hear at least a little bit of perspective from Sandra's perspective as an ally to our community and as a church leader, as a lay leader, if you have anything to add. I really love what both of you are saying, especially the part about listening and asking those questions. I talk a lot about that when I talk about uh, people of color and um, youth and anybody, you know, because a lot of churches ask, how do we get this group of people into our church? And I always ask, well, do you have relationships with those people, you know, with that group, with those individuals? And a lot of times they just look at me like, um, I don't know where to find them. And I'm like, well, open your door and you will, you know, very quickly. So I, I do agree that that is the most important thing is to just listen, to, to start with very relationships quickly. with people. Yeah, exactly. 
you know, to just be in those relationships. And, and um, I think th the more people we get to know, just our whole life just becomes more enriched. And uh, for me, at least, it is it is wonderful to have both of you all in my life. And, you know, I, I learn every time I hear from you all, every time I get to be with you. And I really hope that everybody that's that's watching this right now and that will watch this later also has that sense of, hey, I know somebody that may fit in, you know, in this, like would y'all have the trans youth or the leadership or young people or people of color. And let me see how I can, you know, share my pronouns or how how do I ask those questions and um, I think that is really important for all of us to just like that word I love humbly to be humble enough to say I don't have all the answers I need help when it comes to all of this you know and it's really about relationship and about Christ being God and Jesus to to people thanks Sandra can I can I add something to that about you know listening and building relationships and how important both of those are and how life-giving they are but at the same time once you are building relationships you are going to change and we're going to be changed congregations change when um, different people when new people show up and bishop goal our uh, bishop in uh, delaware maryland said something really on point um, recently he said it's not that people resist change but they resist being changed and that's what relationships do um, when we fully open our hearts. Um, but at the same time, at least in my life, I know it's true that it's, it's been through change that I've experienced um, the most growth. And um, you want change because you're going to grow. So, Yeah, and thank you. And Go it's ahead. not comfortable. <laughs> no, it's not. And know that we're also changing, right? Um, I wanted to say, Atticus, if you could flip to the slide where it has our contact information. Yep. Um, please feel free to reach out. Um, I would be happy to ask some questions. At the same time, and I think uh, Sandra will share the slide, the PowerPoint slide, we also have a slide on resources. There are resources out there. Google exists or Yahoo or Bing, whatever you know, search engine you want to use, so that you can, you can learn a lot by reading about these things and so we provided a few resources to get you started on there's one particular website that has by a trans author who has an incredible amount of resources about pronouns gender transgender 101 for allies for community for churches etc so also inform yourself and then ask informed questions but before you know for me it's like can i ask you a question i just don't just launch into questions you know be mindful uh, and, re and always, always be respectful. And thank you so much, both of you, for the opportunity to speak to you and to be online with you. It's really a treat. Thank you all, too. This has been so, so great. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Atticus. Thank you, David, for taking the time to be with us and to, you know, shed some light on I, I, a lot of questions that we do have. And thank you to all of you who have been with us. Uh, we will uh, post this video very soon so that you can share and so that we can continue this, this conversation. And again, uh, you'll have their uh, um, contact information. And I would, you know, ask whether Atticus or David, if you would love, you know, if, I would love for y'all to close us out in prayer. Uh, so whomever would like to, um, Atticus, open this up. David, I don't know if you want to close us out. That would be great. Or Atticus. Sure. Yeah, no, I could, I could do it. Uh, Atticus, you could feel free to end it, too. Um, God, I ask that um, as you take us through our journeys today and in the upcoming weeks and months and through our lives, that you continue to speak into us, um, that you continue to show us the way at every moment where we make mistakes, let us humbly uh, ask for forgiveness and accept where we have gone wrong and to reach out to those who are not like us to understand with our hearts and with our love and, and with you always uh, on our minds and our hearts to learn to grow and to become closer to you in the name of all that is holy. Amen. Amen. Thank you all Amen. so much. Thank you. See you all soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.